Well, today we pick up with a familiar scene. Paul is held in prison. He's in custody. And he faces yet, once again, another trial. A trial he does not deserve to have. He should be a free man, but he's not. Time has, again, elapsed. It's been a couple of years, and even within our text today, we see days pass, a matter of over a week. And, and so let us not forget that everything that he is experiencing is not in the course of just a, a day or two. That's often how I think we look at different narratives in Scripture. And as we think about the application of our lives, we go, man, why is what I'm going through, my trial, my circumstance, taking it seems so much longer than anything we read? Well, it's, of course, because we are skewed when we read and we forget that time has elapsed here. But today, as we look at Paul before Festus, last time it was Paul before Felix, I want us just to consider two lessons from Paul's trial. Two lessons. So if you would, let's just look at the first kind of half of our text today, verses 1 through 12. I want to read that once again so it's kind of more in our mind as we look at the first lesson. Acts 25, verses 1 through 12, we read, Festus then, having arrived in the province, three days later went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea, and the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul, that he might have him brought to Jerusalem, at the same time setting an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore he said, Let the influential men among you go there with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. After he had, <clears throat> had spent more, not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. And after Paul arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. While Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and to stand trial before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. Here is the first lesson I want us to glean as we look at this first portion of our text of study today. And that is the lesson, as we as Christians will see, getting what we want... in ways we do not want. Getting what we want in ways we do not want. Now let's explore this lesson. Paul's desire to return to Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 20, so that's probably been almost two months ago for us, that was the spark in which God used to get Paul ultimately to Rome, the final destination, if you will. Once entering Jerusalem, if you rewind back a few weeks, Paul experienced an onslaught of angry mobs attempting to say and do anything in order to take Paul's life. And our text today lines up with the very same events that have been transpiring over the course of the last handful of chapters that we've been studying throughout, again, the last several weeks. All of which leads us to verses 10 through 11. I want to focus on this portion, this, this, these two verses. Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me, 
No one can hand me over to them. And now here, it culminates here in the last sentence of verse 11. Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. Well, as a result, how does Festus reply? How does he answer him? He says, you have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. Meaning what? Well, where does Caesar reside? Where does he live? Rome, the capital. So we can say this, Paul here by this declaration by Festus to Caesar you shall go. He's saying, you're going to Rome. What's the significance of this? Well, to have a, a more robust understanding, I want you to keep your place in Acts with a bookmark, but go to the next book of the Bible to Romans. It's just a few pages since we're already at towards the end of Acts. But it's the next book in the Bible over. Romans, I want to look at chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. And as we read Romans, know this, that when Paul wrote this letter, he did so some at least five years before where we are at in Acts today. Probably more like seven or eight years, but some, again, several years before where we are in Acts chapter 25. Paul writes to the Romans as he returns back from his third missionary journey. He's actually going to be on his way to Jerusalem, where at Jerusalem he was captured and tried, and then he went to Caesarea. So anyway, it's a maze there. But let's try to navigate. Romans 1, starting in verse 8, Paul says to those in Rome, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because of your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now, at least by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. So let's pause right there. Verse 10, Paul's praying that it be God's will that he's able to go to Rome and visit the brothers and sisters of Christ there and minister with them. That's my prayer. But he understands that it has to be according to God's will. But then in verse 11, look back there with me if you will. I, see, I think we have the extent of his desire. Verse 11, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in where? Rome. A few comments here. Again, in verse 11, we see the extent. He has a deep burden, a desire. He, we would say, wants to go to Rome. And in verse 11, I love this. He wants to go there. And this is kind of just a side note, if you will. He wants to go there so he might minister to them, that he could be a blessing to them, right? Which I think we get. He, he's the super apostle, the apostle Paul that wrote many of the books of the New Testament, the, the ambassador, the, the great missionary to the Gentiles throughout the Roman world. So we understand, yeah, he wants to go there and he wants to benefit them. He wants to help them. But in verse 11, he also says, when I come there, that you may also be of benefit of me. Here, just again, a quick side note. Nobody is beyond the need of help, need of being encouraged by other brothers and sisters of Christ. If Paul needed encouragement, if there's benefit to be around the believers, the, the gathering of the saints, how much more do we need it in our lives? And then again, verse 13, he says, I often have planned to come to you more than one time. Now, let's flip to the end of Romans. Romans chapter 15. So he begins this epistle 
this letter to the Romans, expressing his desire to come to them. You could say, well, you know, maybe that was just a pleasantry. Maybe he's just trying to get their attention at the beginning of the book. You know, maybe it, it, it's just something nice to hear so that they will listen to what he writes. Well, but that's not the only time he writes and mentions this in his letter. He's serious about this, and we see it in his repetition. At the end of Romans, Romans 15, look at verse 22. He says, For this reason, I've often been prevented from coming to you. Again, <laughs> there's a sense that the Paul's desiring to go and go and go to Rome, but it's continually being prevented. Have you ever wanted to go somewhere or do something? Right? This desire, this want, and yet, for whatever reason, you just can't make it there. I, I, I think of Rick, you and wanting to go down to Texas for your deer hunt, um, a special type there. and that, that was last year, and I don't know how many times it was, but you've been trying to get down there forever. It's like the hand of God is against you on that. Maybe he'll bless you this year. I don't know. But, but we've all experienced that to some degree of being prevented now, verse 23. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I had, have had for many years a longing to come to you, so, so this longing, this desire, it's not just a, a spur of the moment. It's not just a trend for many years. It's not like, you know, the kids during Christmas, that, oh, I have to have this gift, this toy, and it, it's a fad that lasts for a month, if that. No, for many years, he's had this deep inner desire to go to Rome. Verse 24, whenever I go to Spain, I, I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Uh, go down to verse 29. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So he has some sense of assurance that he will get there at some point, verse 30, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Just, it's interesting, here in verse uh, 31, he's given the reason of why he wants the believers to pray for him, because he, he's going back to Judea, he's going back to Jerusalem. He knows that, that it might be a little rocky. Pray for my ministry there. But then in the end, that I may come to you in joy by the will of God. There's this, Okay, here's his desire. He wants to go to Rome. But there's a sense that I think it's only natural. You want to get there with the least amount of problems possible. Right? If you go on a family vacation, where, wherever it might be, it could be driving to New York, it could be driving to California, though I don't know why anybody in this world would ever want to go to California. That's my little sales pitch for that state. Anyway... I'm no better than a certain politician from New York, I guess, now. So I guess I, I need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe that wasn't right. But anyway, going somewhere, we don't like it when a tire blows out. We don't like it when something's wrong with the engine. and there's pro No, we want to get where we want to go with the most comfort possible. After all, we are Americans. But I think that's just kind of custom of human nature. John MacArthur writes about uh, this letter to Ro the Romans. The apostle wrote this letter toward the close of the third missionary journey, most likely around A.D. 56, as he prepared to leave for Palestine with an offering for the poor believers in Jerusalem to the church. And it's interesting here, in Romans chapter 16, there, there are some in our day that would want to uh, poke at Paul and charge him of being uh, a chauvinist. Uh, that he promotes just, just the sense of men are better than women, but nothing could be further from the truth. We, I try to point this out at various times when we come across examples of this, and one is in Romans chapter 16, because how does this letter, this important letter, and it's not only important to the believers at Rome, 
But it's important for all the believers throughout time who would be able to open up their Bibles and get the blessing of reading from Rome and its rich doctrine. Who is entrusted with this letter? Phoebe, a female. Paul was no chauvinist. So let's get back on track here. Here in this portion of our Texas study, if we go back to Acts, we are informed that Paul is going to get what he wants. Again, you have to do the background. The background is Romans. And then the background, he desires to go to Rome. Here, years down the road, we're in Acts 27. He's finally getting his desire. And I do not believe it's a stretch to submit that Paul gets what he wants in ways he does not want. And further, this is no abnormality. This week, I was thinking about Tim Tebow, and I don't know if you know who he is. To some of you, it might be expressing how youthful I am. To maybe some of the younger people here, it might be expressing how older I am. Tim Tebow, of course, is a great athlete. Um, did so many things, uh, college football, he went on to the NFL, of course, uh, even played for those Broncos. I had to cheer for them when he was on there, though. Tim Tebow has a foundation. It's the Tim Tebow Foundation. And I read the, his mission statement this week. It's to bring faith, hope, and love to those needing a brighter day in their darkest hour of need. I don't know. I wasn't able to call Tim Tebow this week. I, he probably wouldn't take my call. I didn't want the disappointment there. But knowing what I know of Tim Tebow, I don't think that's something that just sprang into his mind this last year or two. There's something about his life and his character that I think he desired to see that even early on, earlier on. And now he has this amazing platform to do that, to, to help in this endeavor, to, to bring faith, to bring hope, to bring love to those needing a brighter day in the midst of their darkest hour. Again, I think it's something that he would have desired, wanted earlier in his life. But all the difficulties and obstacles that he went through in his uh, time in the NFL and even other aspects of life, I don't think that's how he would have chosen to get where he is. I think he had a desire to continue to play football. Uh, he, he's one of the few guys I know that led a team to win in the playoffs and yet lose his starting job. I don't know how you feel about Tim Tebow. It doesn't really matter. But I, I think there's a sense, again, that, that, that he's kind of getting where he wanted to be in his ultimate goal in life of helping others, having a, a platform to be able to do that. But I have no doubt he would have struggled along that way and through some of those seasons and circumstances. Now, as we mull over the lesson of getting what we want in ways we do not want, there are some questions I think we need to think through. Questions like, well, do we always get what we want? Because sometimes we go, well, if we always get what we want, I'll settle for going through some bad days. Well, the answer to that is, of course not. And that's rather than saying sadly no. Why? First, it is rather obvious that we do not always get what we want in this life, right? You can just ask any of the, the teens here today. We could ask Jacob back there, Grace, Harlow, Everett, Spencer, Hayden, Isabel. We could ask any of them. H have you always got what you want in life? Probably not. That's a lesson we learn early on in life. Second, it is important for us to understand that we must answer, of course not, rather than sadly no, because of who God is and who we are. Right? If God is sovereign, if he's completely in control, 
if he's all powerful, all wise, just, and good, then we cannot assert that us not getting what we want is negative. Or, woe is me, because I did not get this, and by articulating that, we are assaulting the very character and nature of God. Now, if we do not receive something from God, we must be assured it is for a good in our lives that we cannot understand. If we do not get what we want from, God, uh, from God's hands, it is a result because it's for a greater good in our lives that we cannot understand. Again, the question, do we always get what we want? Of course not. Why? Let's just think of a few reasons here. James 4.2, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. He's telling believers here that there's things in your life, but you're not vertically taken up before the throne of grace. You're not praying, God, help me in this, help me in this. I, I, I desire to see this in my life. Uh, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. James 4.3, he continues, he says, you ask and you do not receive. So now here's the flip side of it. Well, here people are asking, but they're not receiving. Why? He answers, because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You're asking just because of your, out of your own sinfulness, your, your flesh, and what would bring you the most gratification at the moment. Sometimes our heart's desires spring forth from carnal desires, carnal motives. And quite frankly, we do not really want God to give us the fleshly desires of our heart. Psalm 81.12 says, God's speaking here, So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their own heart to walk in their own devices. Dear saints, none of us should desire that. We do not want God to let his hands go of us and go, okay, you're free to walk in your own flesh. Think about the times that you have done that in your life, times that you have made poor decisions and lived according to the lust of the flesh. It does not turn out well. We should not desire God to leave us to the stubbornness of our own hearts. And then one other reason I want to quickly cover here. First John 5, verses 13 through 15 he says, these things I have written to you believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, before God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know that he hears us, and whatever, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Why do we not always get what we want? Because sometimes our heart's desires are not in accordance to God's will. Either his revealed will in his word or his sovereign secret will, which only he knows. So Paul, again, had a deep desire to travel to Rome and once there, actively engage in gospel ministry. In verse 12, in Acts chapter 25, Festus declares that as a result of Paul appealing to Caesar, he will go to Caesar. Obviously, it is uncertain what was going on within Paul, everything he was thinking and feeling once he heard this verdict. But I think we can safely submit, again, Paul's getting what he wants in ways he does not want. And dear brothers and sisters, this remains true for us today. Hopefully, we all have a meta or a grand desire that enca encapsulates all of our smaller desires. This meta desiring, a uh, desire being to grow in Christ more, to know Christ more, and to glorify Christ more. That, that, that should be just the, the, the big picture of our desire out of our lives. And dear saints, if this is a great desire of your life, rest confident. God is more than ready to grant you what you want. But as sure as honey is sweet, it will come about in ways you do not want. Additionally, let's quickly think through a couple of desires that would fall under the meta desire of growing in Christ, knowing Christ, and glorifying Christ. What, let's, what if someone had a deep desire to see 10 people, one to Christ, 
who would produce some fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. What if that was one of their great desires in life? I just want to see 10 people, as many fingers as I have on my hands, I want to see come to saving faith in Christ and go out and produce much fruit. Well, as a result of that, what if God gives them that desire, that want? However, He does that in a way that He sends that person to be a missionary over in China, or Jordan, or Turkey. Right? Normally, again, we have these desires, oh, I want to see people safe, I want to, whatever it is. But sometimes we want the comfortable route, and it doesn't normally work like that. Another example of this, what if there's a couple in Kansas who had a, a daughter, two daughters, three daughters, I don't know, however many the Lord blesses. And as God-fearing saints, we should desire our daughters to, to marry godly men. Godly men who love the Lord, who desire to serve the Lord, and men who would lay down their lives for their wives. I want that for my daughters, right? Maybe you have a granddaughters. I want that for my granddaughters. What if the Lord gives you what you want? But then your daughters marry men who live in California. I'm assuming that doesn't come about in ways you want. But again, we see that in life. And sometimes we, we, we play the victim card. God, why are you, again, just that example, why are you sending my daughters who I love, who are precious to me, why are you sending them halfway across the country? Of course, the answer is, I'm blessing you by giving your daughters faithful husbands. We can't always determine the means to the ends. We need to be content with God granting us the godly desires of our heart even when they come in ways we do not want. This is the first lesson for today. Getting what we want in ways we do not want. And this lies completely out of our control, but we need to be, be able to come before the Lord in prayer with sincerity of heart. Lord, this is my desire. And even if it comes about in ways I do not want, would you nevertheless grant me what I want? Stand up. Maybe it would be a child or grandchild desperately lost. Lord, save them. Would we be willing to pray even at the expense of my own life? Well, let's continue on. Join me back in Acts chapter 25 as we look at verses 13 through 22. Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has, had, has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. And when the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting. But they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss of how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in the custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. 
The second lesson now I want us to focus on with this remaining portion of our text today <coughs> is this. <coughs> Similar is not same. Similar is not same. Now, as we begin diving into this last portion of our text of study again, we see that time has elapsed. Luke records that time passed of several days. What happens after several days? King Agrippa shows up to pay the respects to Festus. Festus, upon meeting Agrippa, begins to inform the king about current affairs, specifically about this uproar caused by this apostle Paul. Festus then tells Agrippa that he sat on the tribunal, presided over the hearing concerning Paul. And here's what I want us to focus on. It's a case in which Festus is a bit surprised. Right, this is gleaned from verse 18. Look at verse 18 once again. They began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting. If it's something that you're not expecting, it's a surprise. How was Festus surprised? Verse 19. But they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. This is the key to the lesson that we are now focusing on. Festus, after hearing from the Jews and then from Paul, he comes to the conclusion that the Jews and Paul only have some some points of disagreement regarding their own religion. This is to say, Festus, he steps back, he concludes that the Jews want to kill Paul for simply holding to some variations of the same religion. This is where we come to see, again, the lesson that similar is not same. As a general rule in life, I think we get this the majority of the time. We can just throw a number out there. Say 90% of the time we understand this. Similar is not same. And to have a little bit of fun with this, I want to pick on three boys. I want to pick on Gus, Tyler, and Wyatt. And if it's okay, Katie, can I pick on you? Okay, good. Well, let's take these three little boys of our church who all have a lot of similarities. They're about the same size, about the same age. They're full octane, always wanting to run around. They each have multiple siblings. They like outdoors, they like video games. They all go to the same church. And just possibly, they might all have dads that drive their mommies crazy. Without question, these three boys are very similar. Now, let's say I need to pick on somebody else. Keith, you're the man. You drew the short straw. Keith has an idea. I'm, I want to take Gus, Tyler, and Wyatt camping, fishing. Sounds like fun for the kids. <laughs> He takes them out. They have a great time. Stay the night. Have a fire. Then the next day, Keith and the boys, they wake up early. And the boys desperately, hey, we, you know what we want to do above everything else? We want to play hide and seek in the woods. Now, this is just an illustration. It's just a story. So, Katie, don't get upset with me here. They're playing hide and seek. He finds Gus. He finds Wyatt. He doesn't find Tyler. He's, oh no, what am I going to do? Oh no, Katie's going to be the first mom to pick up the boys. She's going to pick up Tyler. Tyler's the first one to go, and, and I don't have him. And then he gets an idea. Oh, oh I know. All, all those boys, uh, they're very similar. Uh, she'll get here, and I'll just say, hey, you know, I, I misplaced Tyler. But, but I'll let you pick your choice between Gus and, and Wyatt. Now, I don't know what he's going to tell Shelby and Tony when they get there, but, but he's just worried about the first mom. 
And he says, hey, hey, here you go, Katie. I, I, I did lose Tyler, but here, here's two boys, and take your pick. And I'm sure she's not going to be contemplating all those similarities like, well, I mean, yeah, uh, she's, not, she's going to go off on Keith. You, you lost my son? Yeah, yeah, they're similar, but, but they're not Tyler. Right? Similar is not same, and we understand that. Let's think about other ways, other context. We understand this. The Whopper is similar, but not the same as a Big Mac. Casey's Pizza is similar, but not the same as Domino's Pizza. Diesel is similar, but not the same as gasoline. A dentist is similar, but not the same as a heart specialist. A Dodge Ram is similar, maybe, but not the same as a Ford F-Series truck. Do you understand? Similar is not same. Well, almost everyone, I think everywhere, almost all the time, understands this. There are some aspects of life where the lesson of similar is not same fails to register. And this is precisely what's placed before us in our text today. Festus is, he has contemplated the case that was before him between the Jews and Paul. He concludes both parties have some very similar religious beliefs, so it must be the same. And what we see here in our text of study is what many people think about some of those common world religions in our day. A, a prime example of this in our day, right now especially, is found in Mr. Dallas Jenkins, creator of The Chosen. H have you heard of that show, The Chosen? Dallas Jenkins, his father uh, contributed to the Left Behind series books. Dallas Jenkins has went on the record numerous times to say that Mormons and Christians worship the same Jesus. If you did not know that, you do now. He calls Mormons brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, let's consider, what do Mormons believe? And I'm not saying every single person that goes to the Mormon church. I'm going, at large, what does Mormon doctrine, Mormon dogma, Mormon uh, beliefs, what is it that they believe? Just some to mention here. They believe God is one God among many gods stretching into eternity past. The same God was at one time a mortal, finite human who attained his current exalted state by obedience to eternal laws and principles. Joseph Smith, the, the founder of the Mormon movement, he proclaimed, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. Which, that's what we believe. But he goes on to say, I will refute that idea. They believe Jesus is the firstborn of God's spirit children and the first of many to have become a God. They believe Jesus then is a created being. So, Mr. Dallas Jenkins, when you say that they believe what we believe about Jesus, that we worship the same Jesus, that is incorrect. Similar is not same. They believe that salvation is by grace alone, if you read their sacred text. However, it is a life of obedience to God's commandments is necessary to have one's sins forgiven and receive eternal life. Short answer here is they don't believe that we're saved by grace alone. It's grace and works, just like any other religion apart from Christianity. Look at Jehovah Witnesses. What do they believe? They believe there is no trinity. Jesus is separate from God the Father and an inferior God. That's not the Jesus we believe in. They believe Jesus began his existence as Michael, the angel. That when Jesus came to earth, he ceased to exist as Michael and became merely a perfect human. We don't believe that. We believe he was truly God and truly man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. At death, they believe Jesus' human body was disposed of by God's power, and Michael rose from the dead as the resurrected Jesus Christ. Let me bring it closer to home for us 
who we live in this Ark City community. A few years back, and this was at my last ministerial alliance meeting, the Chamber of Commerce in our community was there. and They were trying to talk to all the, the pastors there. We want to have a community of faith day. We want all the faiths come together under one banner and have a day of celebration of faith. And I was troubled. And I was cautious. And I asked, what do you mean a community day of faith? What faiths? They said, all faiths. I said, so, so, and each little local congregation would be able to have their church's name on a small banner. And I said, well, we can't in good faith have Mount Zion Church next to the Roman Catholic flag, a Buddhist flag, a Jehovah Witness flag, because we're not the same faith. There's different gospels, messages of salvation. And one of the head ladies, she's no longer there, said, well, we all serve the same God. Similar is not same. And many people fail to understand that when it comes in particular to the things of religion. Again, in almost every other aspect of life, we understand it. It is it's as clear or plain as night and day. But when it comes to the topic of religion, for some reason, it gets blurred. Similar is not same. I have no doubt that we get this, again, with everything. But when it comes to religion, I wonder, do we understand the distinctiveness of the Christian faith? Do you understand that the Bible teaches that there is one Eternal God that exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who are co-equal, co-eternal. That this one God created everything. He created man perfect. Man sinned in the garden. And that in man's fallen condition, man is now at war with God. That we can't do anything on our own accord, our, our own power in order to be made right with God. That there is only one and only one means of reconciliation to bring us back in a, a, harmony, uh, a harm, harmonious relationship with God. <coughs> that re uh, reconciliation comes through the mediating work of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Jesus who was born of a virgin, who knew no sin, who lived a perfect life, who gave himself as a sin-bearing sacrifice for all those who would ever believe him upon that cross where he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That in order to be reconciled to God, we could say saved or justified, there's only one means, and that is by God's grace and to exercise saving faith in his beloved son, Jesus Christ. It is but by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone that we are saved. And if there would be any unbeliever here today who has a mentality regarding religion that is similar to Festus in this text, don't you dare leave here before you recognize that similar is not same. And recognizing it, turn to God in repentance and faith. And for all the believers here today, do not get sucked into the thinking of this world that seeks to break down all the distinctiveness between our faith and others. There's a pastor in our community. You can spot his vehicle because he has one of those bumper stickers that, that has a lot of the symbols of all the various faiths. Again, Islam, the cross, I think Buddhist, all these different ones. His message is, well, we all believe the same thing. A few years back, we saw the Pope get up with various religious leaders of different religions around the world. Again, communicating the same thing. But again, similar is not the same. We must not be sucked into this thinking. And then additionally, we who are in Christ need to brush up on our discernment so that we may not be tossed to and fro 
by anything under the guise of Christian. Today we focus on two lessons from Paul's unfair trials. The first lesson, getting what we want in ways we do not want. And the second lesson, similar is not the same. I do not know how these lessons directly apply to you today or in the upcoming days. But dear friends, may we carry these lessons close to our heart that they may aid us as we seek to walk with God in faith until that role is called. May God move His people as He sees fit. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we come before you now. Lord, we understand what Paul is going through is unfortunate. Under arrest for years, been beaten, receiving unfair trials. And then in the midst of it all, we understand that you are sovereign and you're working things out for a particular reason. And Lord, as we just look at verses 1 through 22 today in the 25th chapter of Acts, we just focused on these two lessons. Again, I do, I do not know how that needs to be applied to each person's life here today. But you do. So Lord, we would just welcome the Holy Spirit to minister to our minds and hearts and wills as you see fit. So in Christ's name we pray. Amen.